Hey everyone, thank you for coming to this session. My name is Ravi Devineni. I'm a senior director of engineering for a team that leads cloud and DevOps at Northwestern Mutual. I'm honored to be joined by Shantanu Singh, who's our assistant general counsel. We're here to talk about open source and how large fintech organizations can reap the most benefits from open source. Here's a quick disclaimer. All the content discussed here is the opinion and experiences of the speakers and not representative of a specific company. Please do not consider this as legal advice. A little bit about our company. Northwestern Mutual is a financial services company headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We started as a mutual in 1857, established for the benefit of its policy owners. Today, 165 years later, we're a Fortune 90 company with more than 4.9 million clients. And Northwestern Mutual is the largest direct provider of individual life insurance in the US. We have high degrees of customer satisfaction with 97% of policy owners staying year after year. The agenda for today is we're gonna talk about what open source means for a, for a FinTech organization and what are the various benefits and pitfalls and some of the ways that we have found useful to navigate these pitfalls. Shantanu here is a lawyer and I'm an engineer. With each of these, we're gonna approach this from two different angles. Uh, we will bring two different perspectives, one from a legal standpoint and another from an engineering standpoint. We'll also talk about the lessons that we learned in this journey. We'll start with the benefits of using open source from a legal standpoint. Shantanu. Thanks Ravi for the introduction and thank you for inviting us to this conference, PlatformCon. This slide is going to discuss how open source technology reimagines property rights by fostering collaboration and shared ownership. This is from a perspective of an inclusive approach that disrupts traditional intellectual property rights that have a history of being exclusive and not premised on the concept of open cooperation. It's our perspective that open source encourages innovation across industries and bridges geographical, cultural, and disciplinary boundaries. As our world grows more interconnected, open source licensing provides access to resources and enables faster development and continuous improvement of products and services. Ultimately, embracing open source will lead to a more connected, creative, and equitable industry landscape and global landscape. And this is very true for FinTech. Back to you, Ravi. Thanks, Shantanu. The first and the foremost benefit from an engineering standpoint is that it's faster time to market. There are many standard problems that every company needs to solve, no matter what kind of applications they build, things like operating system, authentication, et cetera, right? Open source provides ready-made solutions. This basically saves time. Saves, times, saves time and hence it's cost effective. And it's transparent too. All of the code is on, out on GitHub. You can see exactly what you're getting. The power of the community is a major factor as well, right? There are a huge number of organizations that support open source software movement. Not only companies, we have thousands of passionate engineers contributing to solve all kinds of problems. And finally, recruiting. Every organization wants such passionate engineers, right? Companies using open source attra can attract such amazing talent. Now let's talk about the other side of the coin, problems with using open source. We'll start with the legal perspective first. Thanks, Ravi. If we look at open source from the perspective of a bundle of sticks analogy, we'll be able to see how open source can create a very fluid and adaptable framework for intellectual property management. If you look at a bundle of sticks where each stick represents a right, like using software, modifying software, or distributing the software, and that one could selectively grant or withhold any of these rights and not give an end user the complete bundle, this concept can cut both ways. In a commercial environment, a stick is worth money. The proprietor of that software will give you sticks to do your work. Those sticks represent rights if you pay them a sufficient amount of money, which they set. In open source, these same sticks, which represent use rights, distribution rights, modification rights, are provided not based upon a monetary incentive, but based upon 
what will foster engagement and collaboration for that project's success. This flexibility in open source nurtures diverse, thriving communities that can evolve to different needs and changing circumstances. Sticks can be taken away, sticks can be put back in. Rights, therefore, are adaptable. By enabling individuals and organizations to choose which bundle of sticks they want, open source projects can accommodate various interests, requirements, and objectives. Moreover, this analogy of a bundle of sticks can stimulate unique partnerships and collaborations where certain rights are granted to different stakeholders even through the same open source project. This way, a diverse set of contributions from different sectors and disciplines can be provided. If open source projects in the future see that they can provide different sticks which constitute rights to different segments of contributors, a single project may have the opportunity to create a more diverse set of contributors based upon giving one segment a certain set of rights that may be different from another segment. This open source model emphasizes the importance of cognitive diversity based upon an understanding that different contributors may have different needs and insights that they can contribute and therefore the same rights should not be allocated across the board. Granted, this is not a concept that is commonly uh, associated with open source projects, but the nature of open source suggests that there is no real prohibition, but it's capped at the creativity of what the contributor and maintainers want as a culture or rules of engagement for their project. In conclusion, if we look at property rights through a bundle of sticks, we see that open source symbolizes the transformative potential of shared resources and collaboration through a focus on inclusion rather than exclusion. By reimagining property rights as a flexible and adaptable set of permissions, open source projects can unlock new possibilities and drive innovation, ultimately fostering a more interconnected and vibrant global community. Thanks, Shantanu. From an engineering perspective, the biggest problem with using open source is the security risk it poses. There are thousands of vulnerabilities that exist in the open source software. All of these vulnerabilities are public knowledge as well. Equifax, SolarWinds, there's a lot of well-publicized cases. With a lot of these security vulnerabilities, right, the question really becomes, can we actually trust open source software? How reliable is the source? And many of these dependencies using, use some kind of versioning, and there's active development happening on many components. So the need for updates and patching is constant. If you don't change your application, essentially your application is becoming stale. Your application is becoming quickly vulnerable. And support also, right? If you run into some issues with some components, what do we do? We can make an issue with GitHub and hope it gets fixed, or we could contribute ourselves and hope it gets ex accepted. There's no active support with any of these. With all of these issues, right, it begs the question that is open source really free? What is the total cost of ownership? But it's not all bad news. I mentioned many nonprofit companies working tirelessly to solve such problems, right? So we'll talk about a few of those solutions. So first, every company needs to know what open source software they have in use. Without that, they're flying blind. This is your inventory. Not just inventory, right? But, but a complete line of sight into what open source is being used and where and what versions are we using and how current are we with them. If a vulnerability gets detected, we need to be able to exactly pinpoint what parts of the company's code base is affected. This is the impact radius. So if you don't have an open source inventory, start here first. One way of doing this is to scan your SCM system, you can scan all the repos and extract dependencies and, and map it all out. Next is to obtain a software bill of materials. Software bill of materials, SBAM, is essentially a list of components that make up your software. If you precisely know what components are in your software, you can get a clear vision of the risk and what. There are various open source tools for generating. I've listed a few here. Each of them have their own specific pros and cons. In 2022, there have been over 25,000 vulnerabilities that have been discovered. This is basically 68 new vulnerabilities being discovered every single day. So we basically need to scan for these vulnerabilities that live in our ecosystem. And 
the scanning needs to be embedded into CI/CD pipelines with, with the ability to block releases of a pipeline when certain high vulnerabilities are discovered. Many tools can help with this. There's, there's a list there. Uh, not an exhaustive list again. Uh, each one of these tools have several pros and cons. You just need to figure out which one is right for you. I mean, and then you create your own block list, right? A list of components that must be blocked from entering your ecosystem. Once you do that, you have to centralize your ingress also. There should be a single entry point for all the open source dependencies for entering into your ecosystem. You can create a simple rule that blocks the dependencies if you have that, right? If they are on, if they are on a list. Several tools support this feature like GitLab and Artifactory. Um, okay, and then uh, we, there's a lot of legal aspects of dependencies also. We'll, Shantanu will talk about those now. Thanks, Ravi. As this slide points out, there are a range of open source licenses that the audience here is familiar with, ranging from permissive, which has more flexible rights, to strongly protective, which have less flexible uh, rights and put more obligations on the end user of the software or the contributor. Whether you're a fintech project enabling open source software compliance within your organization or any other type of organization working on software development or technology development relying upon open source, it's critical that there are a few points you understand as a lawyer supporting that team. You have to understand the product's functionality and the reason why you have to understand the product's functionality is to determine if there are any dependencies of that functionality on open source. And even if you get clear that, you also need to understand your product's deployment and technology um, as counsel for your product team. That will help you determine if there are specific network protective licenses, such as a Faro GPL version three that you should consider. And then work with your team on the technology side to foster a greater understanding of open source as they are the first line of defense. And the more you can educate your product team if they do not have a firm understanding of open source licenses, um, the more enhancement of your compliance, excuse me, your compliance program will be more uh, mature and protected if the licensing requirements are understood. One way to do that is have lawyers as product designers. You move away from written legal analysis of open source issues and more to translating the legal requirements into product features. What does that mean? Can help your engineers understand that they can develop product features into compliance tools or functionality. The reusability benefits of open source um, and the standardization of open source um, will actually make your compliance program less administrative and more pro programmatic. An example to illustrate this concept of lawyers as product designers who are uh, looking at legal requirements and translating them into product features would be understanding a company's risk tolerance for open source and then translating these risks into detecting any variables uh, in the license uh, to, that can be flagged with scanning tools, um, whether it's for a licensing risk or for a vulnerability detection. As open source becomes more ubiquitous in all sorts of industries, not just in fintech, uh, the ability to have programmatic scanning will be a great force multiplier for compliance in any open source usage in an enterprise. So in all of this process, there were some key lessons that we learned, and this is the crux of our message. Open source has so many pitfalls that if an organization comes into it unaware, they could be facing some serious consequences. Organizations, especially fintech ones, need to be approaching open source very consciously. Having an enterprise policy is a must. An enterprise policy that outlines what is your stance on open source, what is your acceptable usage policy, all of this helps tremendously. Once you have a policy, that's a good start, right? The poli but a policy is only a document. A document doesn't really do anything. There needs to be some strong governance around this. Next, automation is the key. There are thousands of dependencies that teams use to build software. There is no way a change committee or a team can review all of them, right? The process needs to be as automated as possible. 
automated governance is the only viable way to implement a governance process. And finally, Shantanu will speak about the critical part lawyers play with all of this. Shantanu? Thanks, Ravi. How can lawyers or a law department be deliberately engaged in DevOps? Translating cybersecurity expectations in terms of what constitutes effective risk management can be translated into the rules that are in the DevOps pipeline or your CICD pipeline for granting or denying deployment of code into a production environment. You can also do that from the perspective of licensing, making sure that code that is deployed is not outside of your risk tolerance of what type of licenses your organization would like to have and allow. Thank you again, PlatformCon, for inviting Ravi and I for this presentation. We greatly appreciate it and enjoy the rest of your presentations.